Ah, the pill scene. Take the red one to nobly endure a difficult reality. Take the blue one to remain coddled by the warm embrace of beautiful lies. We all know it. It's been invoked to describe every shadowy authority or deceptive ideology under the sun. It's no wonder that this scene is perhaps the defining cultural artifact of our era. It perfectly embodies the anxiety of a generation so hyper-connected, so saturated with information, and so relentlessly pursued by the confounding influence of advertising that if we let our guard down for even a second, we can find ourselves thrown behind yet another veil of ignorance. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. So take the red pill. Binge on the little bastards. Don't let yourself be fooled by the powers that be. For some of us, a casualty of this modern disillusionment has been religion. The scientific revolution deanimates our meaning-making myths, the supernatural departs, and faith loses its grip on an increasingly suspicious population. Now we have to deal with economic precarity, social alienation, and ecological breakdown without even the comfort of believing that our suffering amounts to something. Nobody on the other end to redeem our struggle. A paralyzing skepticism sets in, and our lives feel little more than an obscene dance upon the grave. Enter Jordan Peterson, whose undeniable celebrity is in no small part due to his recognition of this crisis of meaning, a crisis that many, myself included, know all too well. One of Peterson's prescriptions to tame insufferable chaos is to orient yourself towards God. He hosts a Bible study series on the Daily Wire, is regularly moved to tears by the beauty of Christ, and in some form or other, considers himself a Christian. For Peterson and his favorite novelist Dostoevsky, fancying yourself a neo who takes the red pill and creates brave new values untethered from a sense of transcendence will not create the Nietzschean superhero that advances mankind. It will only result in profound anguish and moral degradation among those who think they can tread water in the void, subsisting only on a diet of hard logic. Dostoevsky said straightforwardly, if there's no God, so if there's no higher value, let's say, if there's no transcendent value, then you can do whatever you want. There is the sense that there are only two choices, Nietzsche or Dostoevsky, to create new values or admit that there are no better ones than the old ones. But what if there was another way? What if there was a third pill? What if we could reclaim meaning in our lives without reverting back to the old faiths? I recently had a conversation with social theorist Daniel Gertz, who, along with his writing partner Emil Fries, write under the pseudonym Hansi Freinacht. Daniel and Emil are trailblazers in an emerging tradition of thought known as metamodernism. Their vision of metamodernism is a synthesis of modernism and postmodernism, of left and right. Their most recent book is entitled 12 Commandments for Extraordinary People to Master Ordinary Life, a play off of Jordan's bestseller, Daniel and Emil attempt to, among other things, address some of the same issues as Peterson through their unique theoretical lens one of which is the crisis of meaning resulting from what Nietzsche called the death of God. I mean, we're, we're not built for all that level of abstraction or secularity or secularism, right? We're, we're, we're built, built to have fairly close to home ideas about a spirited world um, and so forth. So, so we're suffering for it. But first, it's important to understand Peterson's prescription for nihilism that Daniel is responding to. What exactly is the nature of Peterson's faith? It's not a question that he's particularly fond of, so it can be difficult to succinctly describe his position. Sometimes he says he acts as if God exists. Sometimes he says he simply fears that he may exist. Sometimes he frames God as a metaphor for a set of stories that guide you through life, or as the point where the narrative world and the objective world collide. Other times, as a pattern of interpretive structures that have arisen through evolution that mediate our interaction with the physical world, and other times still, as an opportunity to profess fealty to the source of seeming seemingly universal moral intuition, and other other times, he says that the Bible is truer than true, that it sets the preconditions for the manifestation of truth. And while these are quite eloquent ways of describing the divine, it's nevertheless undeniable, as Sam Harris pointed out in a widely viewed debate, that most people consider these stories historical truths, which they are likely not. I'm not hearing a, a, a God, a personal God, who can 
possibly hear anyone's prayers, much less answer them. And despite his ability to frame faith in a way that exempts it from requiring historical accuracy to still be true, the criticisms of religion that I've attributed to the rise in secularism remain valid. Namely, that religion can hold such an ideological hold over people that abuses of power are likely to follow. Think the Catholic Church scandals or suicide bombers, and Peterson's position risks contributing to such modes of domination. So what is to be done? Can we lift ourselves out of the mire of indifferent agnosticism without submitting to dogma? Daniel thinks we can, and he explains it through a progression of ideological development that will likely sound familiar to many of us. It goes like this. The first stage is one of authenticity and sincerity. This is where you believe in the religious mythology of your choice as if it were real historical events, and that the veracity and consequences of these stories reflect a universal logic of how existence operates, and from that, a correct way to guide our lives emerges. We believe in it honestly, worship it candidly, and live our lives by it authentically. For the sake of this example, this would be the blue pill. The second stage is one of irony and nihilism. In this stage, an emphasis on secular reasoning and scientific verification makes you question the credulity of these historical events as you start uncovering the ulterior motives that led to the dissemination of these purported virtues and values. You start to think that faith was just a placebo, a comforting fiction. Like a dog who needs his medicine wrapped in a piece of cheese, we need our values and morals wrapped in fun stories. But we fancy ourselves more sophisticated and independent than a dog, so we toss the placebo aside, scorn those who thought they could fool us, and forsake all belief. This red pill stage is where you idolize season 3 Rick Sanchez and Alan Moore's Joker, or Christopher Nolan's Joker for that matter. I've certainly been there. You may feel noble in your dedication to existential freedom, but treading water in that void can be thankless and exhausting. The third stage is Daniel's metamodern pill, what he calls sincere irony, a synthesis of the prior two stages, when we start to recognize a certain existential poverty in relentless skepticism, and start to become skeptical of skepticism itself. Follow it to its end point, and you're skeptical even of skepticism itself, you realize that skepticism itself has its blind spots. You still maintain that these religious myths were conjured by cunning minds who puppeteer our emotions to promote order and nevertheless decide to believe them anyway. You, in a sense, make yourself intentionally gullible. You let yourself be benevolently fooled. We don't believe in the Wizard of Oz, nor do we wholesale discredit the world erected in his image just because we know he's a charlatan behind a curtain. We do both. We put our our mind in a state of deep belief and healthy skepticism at the same time, so that we can experience the wonder of the wizard's world while simultaneously being ironic enough about it so that we don't let the wizard convince us to go to war for him. A metamodern disposition towards the divine for Daniel is about reclaiming the magic of the world while keeping it at enough of a distance so that we can still inhabit the perspectives of people with other values, so that we don't become dogmatic and we don't let people offering religious epiphanies take advantage of us. It's about wavering between two contradictory positions so that we can get the best of both. Eventually, I believe, at least, there's an attractive point that's a sort of superposition of both, which you might call the philosophical mind. The philosophical mind is when there's both intellectual depth and management of complexity, and there is a sense of spiritual depth. Metamodern perspectives are all about reconciling seemingly contradictory mindsets. For example, informed naivete, knowing that what you believe in is naive, but believing it anyway because it will ultimately provide better outcomes. Or pragmatic romanticism, taking an unapologetically romantic view towards life, but steering it in the direction that gives you the most passionate and enjoyable experience possible. And so the ingredients for Daniel's third pill is actually a two-step step recipe. First, take the red pill, then try out several blue pills. In his words, once you've vaccinated spirituality with relentless skepticism and ironic distance and the most ruthless nihilism imaginable, you can begin to reclaim the spiritual realm. 
we become not unwitting beneficiaries of the placebo effect, rather we become masters of it. Their idea is much less the original Matrix trilogy and much more The Matrix Resurrections, a film that slaps us in the face with irony for the first half, as it playfully paints the franchise as nothing more than a revenue stream for Warner Brothers. It's the market's tough. I'm sure you can understand why our beloved parent company, Warner Brothers, has decided to make a sequel to the trilogy. And then for the second half, asks us to revert back to the same sentimental love story of the first one and to believe it sincerely. Through this metamodern lens, we can think of religion not as eternal, untouchable truths, but as truth claims that can be reconsidered, reconfigured, and in some cases rejected. That means, historically, we can excavate the greater existential truths behind the largely untrue historical claims. For example, did Jesus die on the cross for our sins? Maybe a guy named Jesus was crucified, but it wasn't a metaphysical trade-off. However, quote, People including Jesus, martyrs and heroes of humanist values who gave us freedom, dignity, and equality, did endure suffering for us to be here. Were we thrown into the world with original sin because God's prototype for man ate a forbidden apple? No, but, quote, We really are sinners in that we shouldn't think of ourselves as inherently good, but rather see good as a constant site of effort due to our flawed moral and cognitive capacities. Is prayer powerful because an omnipotent being is listening and granting wishes by their whim. No, but prayer is powerful because it's a meditation on gratitude, an exercise of humbling yourself before the grand mysteries of the universe. Love him or hate him, Peterson has undeniably diagnosed an illness in our society. Meaning is not something that more primitive people required that we have evolved past. There is a real nausea that comes from eating a diet of only red pills on an empty stomach. But, and maybe it's the idealist in me, I can't help but desire a different prognosis beyond atavism. Peterson and Dostoevsky may be right that forging new values from the ashes of the old gods will bring nothing but ruin, but I want to believe that the only path isn't going back, that there is progress to be made. Is Daniel's answer the next stage of cultural development? Well, I'm not entirely sure, but my worldview is always changing, and I find his formula of juggling, quote, two opposite positions and seeing how they fit together to take us to higher planes of understanding, quite inspiring and quite stimulating. We ought not be ashamed to find comfort in myths, religions, stories, whatever creates meaning, even if there are modes of thought that cast doubt on them. We need to build a world that values constant pursuit of truth, but also recognizes the problem of a world without higher planes to reach for. Life needs to be magical, but we also need to be honest. Can we do both? I think so. If you want to listen to my entire conversation with Daniel, then head over to my coffee page. There's no paywall, so you can watch the full interview for free, but if you find value in this content, I'd appreciate your support, and you can give your support right there on coffee. We talk Peterson, religion, and what a metamodern future might look like. Don't forget to check out my Twitch stream, and as always, thanks so much for watching, guys. Peace.